Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Mac Voices Magazine, our free Flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, I feel the need to talk about social media. And there, there's so much going on about around social media right now, good and bad. And I wanted to converse with someone who has kind of an even temper, even perspective on things, um, you know, give, has given it a lot of thought, but also is willing to share some of his own own story uh, with his interactions with social media. Couldn't think of any better anybody better than Mr. Peter Cohen. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much, Chuck. I think that's the first time in my adult life that anybody's referred to me as even tempered. Wow, I you know. <laughs> Well, thank you. We, we we will test it. We will test, it, especially there, when we talk social media. There we go. Yeah, indeed. No kidding. That's yeah. really kind of the the, uh, the 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 existential dilemma, isn't it? Well, it it is, Peter. And I've I've been particularly interested as as I always do. I, I've you have I, I really respect you and admire you because you wear so many of your thoughts and your feelings kind of on your sleeve, and you're very open about sharing them. And that's why when I saw you start to make some changes in your social media profiles and participation, I thought, you know, this might be a good discussion for some of the things I've been thinking about, too. So how about if I ask you to just give you give a quick little update about where you are with your social media presences? Shrinking as much as possible, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I uh, used to have a very active Twitter presence. And within the last six months or so, I really ratcheted that down. In fact, I purged my Twitter account um, of all of my old tweets and uh, uh, stopped using Twitter altogether in December. Um, I maintain a Facebook account and I've got hundreds of, uh, of friends, people I know from real life primarily, um, are, are connected with me on Facebook. And of course, I use LinkedIn um, as, as a professional resource to stay in touch with people professionally who might be interested in business networking. I also have an Instagram account that I use occasionally when I've got a cute picture of my cat I want to share or uh, have eaten some very tasty food that I want to show off. Or a lot of times when I'm, uh, when I'm exercising, I like to run and I love to walk. Um, and I live in an area just filled with natural beauty. I'll snap off some photos of you know vistas or imagery, nature imagery that will inspire me and I'll put it there too. Um, but you know, if, if you had asked me a year ago, Chuck, I would say, um, 80% of my time was probably spent on Twitter and 20% of my time was spent on the other ones. And, you know, Twitter is just no longer part of my life anymore. And that really surprised me because in, if, for so many of our friends, and I think, Maybe it's changed, but in in the tech community for the longest time, Twitter was definitely the preferred social network, and you had a Facebook account sort of because you had to. And I'm not sure if it's completely changed, but it does seem like the complexion of Twitter has changed a bit. Well, the complexion of the of Twitter changed, and you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but the complexion of, the, of Twitter changed in 2016 during the presidential election. Um, it became a it can became an incredibly polarized, very toxic environment for a lot of people. Now, I admit in retrospect that I I played into that um, as much, if not more, than a lot of other people did on Twitter. I was as as you said at the outset, Chuck. I'm very open with whatever I'm thinking. I probably have a problem with being so open about what I think. <laughs> Uh, but that was also one of the reasons why I really dialed back my Twitter account as well. But you know, I was um, finding that that it was crazy making for me. I would open Twitter and immediately be confronted with, um, you know, in many cases, contradictory information or information that was very upsetting to me for whatever reason because it didn't jive with my political view or my social view, or somebody was being insulted, or you know, it, you know whatever. And it set off a feedback loop of, you know, wanting to respond to whatever it was I was reading and waiting for the affirmation of my uh, followers, you know, with likes or retweets or commentary. That that feedback loop, that that dopamine response trigger was so incredibly addictive 
really it's no different than sitting in front of a slot machine at a casino or, uh, you know, any other really highly addictive or, you know, taking a hit off a crack pipe. It's, it's a very highly addictive behavior. And it's a behavior that's so, that, that, that the, the engineers who develop social media and for that matter, develop video games designed for mobile and other platforms exploit very heavily to get you to come back to do it over and over again. They want that reward loop uh, to be so gratifying that you want to do it over and over again. And, you know, social media is is no different. So realizing that I was really kind of caught in that feedback loop and that, quite frankly, it was crazy making because all I was doing was was adding fuel to the Internet outrage machine, if you will. I finally divested myself from it. I said, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. And I removed myself from Twitter um, and, you know, reinvested a little bit of the time that I was spending on Twitter on other social networks, but really tried to find more appropriate ways to use my time and my energy and my focus. So you mentioned that you purged all your old tweets, which I find particularly interesting um, because there's, I mean, let's face it, for all of us, that's a bit of history of our lives. Go to oh, bed. I kept the history, Chuck. Oh, I you kept, kept the history. Okay. okay. Yeah, just like just like a lot of uh, social media accounts, Twitter doesn't enable you to download all of your own data, and that includes all of your own tweets and uh, replies and so on. And I did that. I, I made sure to have an archive of that, which I've you know saved locally on my computer and also stored uh, securely in the cloud. So in case anything does happen to my computer, I still have a copy of it someplace. But it's no longer on Twitter. So it's no longer searchable, indexable information that somebody may be interested in profiling me for good or for bad um, could use to assess how I feel about certain things. I thought it was important to lock that information down as best I could. Hmm. So it was more about, oh, here, I, here we go. I, I knew we were going to end up here. So it's mm -hmm. more about some of your privacy? It absolutely had a lot to do with my privacy and the realization that I'd spent almost a decade on Twitter, just sort of freeform saying anything that came to mind. In a lot of cases, it was, you know, stuff that I look back on and 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 am not happy with what I posted. And you know, it's, you see this over and over again. And I'm not saying that I'm a public figure. I'm not, but public figures will be called out on. Uh, contradictory information that they give in, on Twitter over time. Well, you said this about this policy issue, Mr. Senator. Six months ago, you tweeted this opposite thing. Explain the contradiction. You know, if, that appears to have be a little bit of cognitive dis dissonance. People's thought, the, the fact of the matter is that in any kind of social situation, and, and really anybody who has a life of the mind at all, anybody who isn't, you know, an incompetent thinker is going to evolve what they think over time. You know, and, and you know, things that I said five years ago may not be reflective of how I feel today. Well, the problem with Twitter is that that information is there forever. So a prospective employer doing effective enough data mining on a prospective employee, let's say, could find out, hey, you know, Peter is in favor of this legislation, which, you know, maybe may not be something that, that uh, we are paying lobbyists in Washington to support. So that's a red mark against him. I'm 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 going off on a tangent here. I'm not saying that you know this has happened to me directly, but this is the sort of thing that when we leave a very public social media footprint that we maybe an uh, un, uh, just completely in an unaware way put out and and don't realize it is out there. I I I love Twitter in terms of its immediacy and in terms of its ability to connect me and my content with an audience, I think it's really invaluable as far as that's concerned. But I don't really do a lot of public facing content um, creation anymore. I'm no longer in tech journalism. Uh, so I don't have that audience that I need to connect with in that immediate way. So for me, Dialing back that Twitter account made a lot of sense. I don't begrudge anybody who's got a Twitter account and who uses that Twitter account all the time. But for me, there were reasons of diminishing returns, including privacy, um, it, including uh, security, and just in, in terms of my own mental health where I was like, you know, this really isn't the most productive use of my time anymore. Yeah. I, I, I applaud you for the recognition that – Opinions, positions, thinking evolves and changes over times. Sometimes the times change, 
and your your position goes with it. Sometimes, you know, what was in favor is no longer in favor. And you may not have moved, but the ground shifted under you, and what was seen as very, very acceptable and favorable suddenly becomes very unacceptable and unfavorable. And so, yeah, you, at the very least, you have to watch what you're putting on there and, and what you're responding to. Yeah, you know, I think that it's really interesting how it manifests in different parts of our life now, too. Here's a practical example that I'd never thought of, but this is a very real issue. Um, there's a very popular company called Riot Games. They make uh, what's called a uh, uh, multiplayer online battle arena or MOBA game uh, that's been played for years and is enormously popular called League of Legends. A lot of people have played the game. It's enormously popular across different age spectrums, across different countries. It's internationally popular um, across different economic strata. You know, everybody likes to play League. And it's so common that you can go to a department store or an electronic store and buy Buy you know a gift card so you can use hard currency in the game to get to get further ahead. It's an enormously popular game, multi billion dollar game. Well, people who want to work for Riot Games, for example, as a as a condition of of prospective employment, as they're filling out their employment application, they have to link to the gamer tag that they use to play Riot Games. So uh, you, my online moniker, more often than not, is Flarg, F L A R G H, and you know, if that were my moniker on uh, Riot's server, server, I would have to link that uh, in order to apply for a job there. Well, they have a red light, yellow light, green light system uh, for figuring out prospective employers. And guess what? If you are an in-game troll, if you're somebody who's been repeatedly complained about to the system administrators who actually manage the game because you're foul-mouthed or because you're a cheater or because you're just a, a like a bad sports person – you get red lighted during the 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 um, credentials review process of that application, and you don't get looked at a second time. You are banned from working at Riot. They don't want jerks working for them. Now, this is a very microscopic um, uh, example of 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 this phenomenon. But here is a case where your social media footprint your footprint in that game anyway, has a very real world ramification on your employability. You know, this is where your social media profile actually affects your FICO score, potentially, hmm. you know? Now, to, we're seeing China actually really go fur further with this, where, you know, people are, are being given social media scores that affect their ability to borrow money, that affect their ability to get jobs, that affect their, their ability to find real estate. Um, they're really out in front on this for good or for bad. And personally, I think it's for bad. But your social media footprint has a profound impact on a lot of different parts of your life that I don't think we really think about very much. And, you know, we're, we're, we're glib to share this content because so many of us feel that sense of, of, uh, of uh, gratification when we do share it. And when we, I know that Chuck, I love to see you and, and all my other friends on Facebook commenting on things I post. I feel like, oh good, I've engaged them. I've given them something interesting to think about. Aren't I a wonderful person for doing that? <laughs> well, you are, you are. Oh, well, thank uh, you, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, this, some of what you just described sounds like a, a you know an episode of Black Mirror. Um, oh yeah, the, it, the one with uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, as a matter of fact. Yeah, uh, and yeah. just, it, it, and I don't know how I feel about that because if I if I step over in the game company's shoes, I can understand why they wouldn't want that kind of person associated with their brand. Not so, only that, but why they are perfectly justified in excluding that particular class of gamer from their HR roles. I mean, they're a liability, right? Yeah. You know, these are people who've already demonstrated antisocial behavior. They've already demonstrated an unwillingness to work within the normal social confines that the rest of us take for granted. So why the hell should they get a job? Yeah. No, let them, let them eat out of a garbage can. They're jerks. <laughs> well, but I have to admit, I'm, I'm having mixed feelings here because, you know, that means that somebody interprets my social media profile as a negative. So, I mean, that's me, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean I come to the office with it. It's just that that's, that's what I do in my spare time, whether, whatever but, that is. But you see, this is the essential problem for years. I really, ever since the, the inception of the internet, you know, Chuck, I, I know that we are sexy as hell, and looking at our visages on the screen 
you know, the, the, the viewers may not know this, but we've been around for a little while in the personal computer business. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of changes in personal computers over the years. We're, we're, we're not kids as, as much as our, 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 our young, uh, uh, visages might, might, uh, suggest otherwise. We, we've seen really the entire spectrum of social media from its very inception on the internet in the form of bulletin board systems and, uh, Hus Usenet news groups, uh, and IRC chat, right, all the way through AOL and eWorld and uh, CompuServe and Prodigy and, uh, you know, leading right up to the modern internet and uh, social media services and platforms like Twitter and Facebook and, and all the other ones that exist. And what, what we know over and over again is that anonymity breeds the most foul, toxic behavior. If you if if you think you can get away with not being recognized, you will act in the most outrageous way that you you possibly can uh, compared to how you you work in real life. And uh, you know, we've seen this over and over again where you, you might have the opportunity to confront somebody online um, that 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 you know is is threatening you or acting in a very adversarial manner to you online, and they are the meekest, uh, uh, quietest person you could possibly imagine in real life, somebody completely opposite from that that gruff uh, online persona that they they had worked so hard to create. So anonymity in, in social media is a big problem. It's a big reason why um, Twitter has had so much so much many problems. There's no linking of your real life um, uh, uh, profile. Um, to in Twitter, in Facebook, you know, we we hear about tens of thousands of Russian bot accounts used to, you know, weight information in favor of one viewing group or another. Um, and, and of course, journalists, mainstream journalists, tend to take what happens on social media very seriously because they're looking at trends, they're looking at overall data analysis, and they might not be asking themselves the tough question: How much of what I've, what I'm seeing trend on Twitter right now, is actually organic versus how much of it is the creation of, uh, you know, botnets that that are that are trying to make me think that this is more important than it is. It. It's a dystopian nightmare, and it, it you know we're overwhelmed with information on a, on a daily basis, and social media isn't helping that at all. Okay, so so you left Twitter, yeah, but you stayed on Facebook. Which, if if I'd had to bet, and I and I absolutely agree with you on the when Twitter kind of turned, and I know I have I've. I've been kind of consistently unfollowing some folks because it it becomes a bit of an echo chamber. You know what their position is, and therefore, and and it seems like there's there's it's it's black or it's white, and whichever side they're on, that's all they're going to see, and that's not the kind of interaction that I enjoy. And unfortunately, I've had to unfollow some people. But I would have I would almost thought that you would have stuck with Twitter and gotten away from Facebook. What what is it about Facebook that makes it at least a little more palatable at this point? Okay, well, let's see. In no, in no specific order, the reason why I like Facebook more than Twitter is because I have infinitely more control over my audience, right? I've got my audience set to, to friends only. You know, so when I post something, it posts to my friends list. Um, and I've got sharing locked down for most stuff, too. So, so I don't want my content easily shared with other people. Um, I have a much more limited audience on Facebook than I do on Twitter, and that makes for a more intimate, intimate conversation, you know, more interesting exchanges with people. Um, and uh, Facebook also allows me to get a thought out. You know, it's, it's not limited to 280 characters. You know, I can go okay. four or five paragraphs. And hey, look, some people don't want to read books, and that's cool. But you know what? I write for a living. I don't want to lock my thoughts into whatever pithy, wise-ass comment I can make in 280 characters, because I don't necessarily think that that's the most uh, productive way for me to communicate. And I don't think that – I think that it's it's a hindrance more than a help when it comes to um, uh, hearing what other people have to say as well. Okay, I hadn't thought about it that way. And where 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 I get very uneasy with Facebook and still with Twitter as well is so much of the content is uh, lives or dies by the algorithm. The algorithm that you never see. The algorithms that Facebook and Twitter and other social media networks use uh, in order to make your information visible to other people. 
Yeah, but I, I, I personally feel more comfortable with Twitters because I feel like it's not being filtered in quite as much. I mean, I feel like if you post something, I, I realize you're not there, but if you post something on Twitter and I'm subscribe and and I'm following you, there, the odds are pretty good that I'm going to see it. I, I've I have I know I can't t begin to tell you how many times someone has said, "Hey, did you see that on Facebook?" No, I didn't, and and I go scrolling through my feed, and unless I go to that person's identity, I, I'm never going to see it. I don't know what it is about the algorithms that say that, okay, that that post from person X is not interesting to Chuck, but it, and it makes me a little crazy because I feel like I have not a lot of control over it. Yeah, you know, there, there are things about Facebook that I really detest, like, for example, how no matter what you do, your newsfeed will always default to top stories as opposed to most recent. Uh, but then you have, you know, other manual control over things that you don't have on Twitter, like, for example... Um, you know, uh, you, you can, uh, set, set specific friends or specific groups, um, to, to, to show their information higher in your timeline. You can weight their information, um, compared to others. So if there are specific sites or specific friends that you, whose updates you always want to see, you do have a little bit more, um, control over that with Facebook. Now, don't get me wrong. Facebook is the antichrist, especially with this whole Cambridge Analytica <laughs> thing. But, you know, I think that's another thing that people really kind of miss the forest through the trees. Well, we're all freaking out about Mark Zuckerberg and 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 Facebook and what they're going to do. And, oh, boy, is Twitter actually harboring, um, you know, vile racists and 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 bigots uh, in order to drive more traffic. You've got to accept that every byte of information that goes across your network connection at some level or another is being monitored by your ISP. So if you're forking over money to Time Warner or uh, Comcast or Verizon or somebody else every month uh, in order to give you a nice fat pipe to the internet – Honey, they're getting way more demographic information about you than Facebook could ever dream of. Let's be real here for a second. You know, that's a much bigger problem in terms of personal privacy um, than whatever specific social media service you might spend some of your time on. Yeah, that's a great point, And it is one that gets lost very, very quickly. I mean, it gets lost very quickly because that message is is the, the the companies that are selling these services do everything they can not to make it a public a, a public affairs issue, and the people that are out there making their living from the media often really don't want to point that out because that means that somebody up up the chain in their organizations is getting that information and yeah and sometimes Peter I feel like. We get a little paranoid over, you know, that everybody's out to get us. Everybody's getting our information. And Everybody is. Yeah, that's yeah, well, absolutely yeah. right, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess that's it. But they're all using it in some nefarious fashion. And so far, I guess the most nefarious thing is that they are pushing ads to us constantly about what they think we want to buy. Annoying, yes. And and certainly, I don't want to. I don't want a camera in my living room or an open mic in my living room. But at the same time, is it worth all the all the all the horror that we seem to to hold? Well, I think that part of the problem here is, you know, there there part part of us, especially those of us who've been around for a while, a while, are probably more prone than others to techno utopianism. You know, assuming that this is a problem, it's a technology problem, which just means that, you know, we we got to put the right minds on it to fix the problem because we can fix any technology problem because we're the smartest monkeys in the tree. You know, where the monkeys that got down from the tree and figured out how to use uh, how to use tools, and you know, the rest millions of years later is history, right? Um, so, uh, this is a, a surmountable problem from that perspective. But the problem is that the the the, the pace of technology is, is much faster than the pace of social change. And while we develop these tools and these cool services that we use, we really don't think ahead of time um, how how they're going to be used. And I mean, Facebook is a prime example of this, a case in point, you know, in that, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, who recently talked to reporters on the phone about the recent data data exchange with Cambridge Analytics and, and what Facebook is doing as a result of that, said, you know, that he's, he's learning from this stuff, but that he didn't take it seriously when, you know, he first heard that, 
uh, fake news was the thing on Facebook and, and that he, he should have acted faster to it. You know, it's the law of unintended consequences. The things that we make, the things that we use, and the media that we depend on, like Facebook or whatever else, are only as good as their creators. And their creators aren't omniscient. So all of these products, services, and platforms are going to have flaws that we really didn't think through or, or didn't have the, the presence of mind to think about before we started using them. You know, I, I intended to say this at the opening of the show, and I completely forgot because we started having too much fun. But Peter and I set this up before um, the the shooting at YouTube, um, and so you know that this is not a reaction to that. This was one we had planned, and I I actually thought about delaying it a little, and it's like no, this this, this is pertinent, um, and and that, and and some of what we know, at least as at least what I've seen as we record this goes back to that earlier comment of yours that social media can be such a dopamine hit. Now, there's some indications that the shooter was uh, perhaps financially motivated. And, you know, that too brings a whole nother aspect to this thing of, you know, we're putting ourselves out on stage. And if somebody pulls that stage out from under us, <laughs> there, are, there are consequences, unfortunately, with people that are maybe less than uh, not, not ready to say stable, but less than uh, civil. How's that? Absolutely. I mean, you don't go into a, a crowded office building with a weapon uh, firing at people and then ultimately turning it on yourself unless, uh, in, you know, things have, have gone really off track for you. So um, uh, there's a lot more to the story than just that. But that is a very good point, Chuck. And, you know, YouTube is, is interesting because here's a situation where, you know, we hear all the time, well, if you're not paying money for a service or product you, you use, you are the product. Well, YouTube is interesting because YouTube allows you to monetize yourself as the product if you're smart enough, if you're creative enough, and if you can uh, generate a large enough audience to watch your stuff, you know, whether it's a gamer uh, saying funny things during a Twitch stream, or it's uh, uh, you know a, a makeup blogger at home showing you the latest techniques for doing really cool eyebrows. People are ultimately, in in many cases, on YouTube monetizing themselves. And if YouTube changes the terms that uh, upon which they will get monetized, as they have. That can create not necessarily just economic hardship for people, but in the case of entrepreneurs who are trying to get businesses off the ground or trying to establish themselves as a brand, this can be a make or break moment. This can be a difference between, you know, dying in obscurity, as it were, or you know, becoming a big star and 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 uh, and and having great things happen. Now, I'm not saying that that was the situation with the, with this particular shooter. Uh, as as you said, Chuck, it's still very early in the investigation, so we still don't have all the facts. But the fact remains that we have seen YouTube pull up stakes from specific um, uh, YouTube personalities that that have done very well on the service and have ended up, up costing them a lot of money um, when they've done things to violate the YouTube terms of service or the Google terms of service, I guess I should say. But that's a key point. They violated the terms of service. So if, if I have the right to use a service in a particular way, and that's what the service provider tells me, and I violate that, then, you know, I think, I think they're justified in being pulled, regardless of how big a star they were. I mean, you and I have both seen, let, let's, let's shift to Hollywood for the heck of it. You know, we've seen some major stars be taken down by bad behavior. You know, how many, how many people do you know, Peter, that say, well, you know, I grew up in the 60s, and it was a different time then, and, and you know, the drugs were, were different, and, you know, so many things were different. And well, people, that was also Harvey Weinstein's excuse, so how yeah, far do you let that go? Well, see, that's just it. You know, I mean, that, again, I've, I am not condoning any of that behavior, but you also have to wonder, you know, where, where is the line? There, there's a line somewhere. I just don't – not smart enough to know where it is. Well, you know, what was it, 40 years ago or more, a um, Canadian professor uh, named Marshall McLuhan, uh, you know, had a, uh, um, uh, a famous quote about the medium being the message. You know, the medium's the message uh, is what he said. And, uh, he, you know, here's a guy who very early in media studies, you know, this is long before the internet, you know, understood that the 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 the, the ever evolving shape of media, whether it was newsprint or full color glossy magazines, radio, 
television, motion pictures, uh, TV news programs, um, you know, the advent of the 24 hour news cycle with CNN and, uh, other cable news. Um, and finally with the internet, all these have had a profound effect on, on how we digest and absorb and are exposed to this information as opposed to just what the information is. You know, it was very different 40 or 50 years ago when we were primarily getting our news from newspapers. You know, newspapers like the Washington Post were able to go deep um, on, uh, you know, the Watergate uh, 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 um, uh, imbroglio. The, the, fast forward a few years and, you know, you had wall-to-wall news coverage of uh, uh, the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan, for example, or, uh, you know, so in, in roughly the same time period, the, the, the murder of John Lennon, you know, the, these were things that got around the world almost instantly because we had gone from reading it in paper, which takes time for, for you know, the, the, the story to be written and reported, uh, you know, to... Um, uh, uh, that that instantaneous around the world communication thanks to satellites and television. So it, it really is interesting how it's evolved over the years, but we haven't evolved over the years. You know, we're the same <laughs> thinking creatures that haven't really evolved that much, you know, in the span of half a century. Um, what we have done, though, is we've taken these devices in our pockets, you know, we've taken our phones, you know, we've taken our computers, we've taken our iPads, and we've offloaded a lot of frontal lobe activity, a lot of executive function that we don't want to be saddled with. I don't know about you, Chuck. I don't know anybody's phone number anymore. I can still remember my grandmother's phone number from when I was five years old. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know what your phone number is. But you know what, buddy? I've had your phone number on my phone for at least 10 or 15 years. <laughs> Yeah, you know, but all I yeah. all I have to do is say, "Hey Siri, dial Chuck, and I'll get connected to you." You mm. know, it, it, we've we've our brains might not have evolved, but our thinking processes have changed over time, and I think that that's as evident in social media as it is everywhere else in modern life. Yeah, I I agree with you, and and suddenly it's so much easier to share our views, whether they be shoot from the hip views, whether they be extreme views whether they be well thought out views and and I I wish people maybe could dial back just a little bit on the on the shoot from the hip stuff. You want it to go extreme? Uh, all right, you know, but you better be prepared to justify it as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, the this this tendency to just comment on everything and be glib about everything, it's just it's clogging up the channels. And that's one of the things I think I object to the most right now because I I've I mean, I have intentionally set up my Twitter feed as almost a news feed. You know, there are still some some friends that I follow very religiously on on there, but for the most part, news sources, information sources um, that I feel like, okay, I can pop this up and I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on at any given moment in the world from, you know, from different standpoints. I, I don't just follow one news service or, you know, it, on the left and one news service on the right. You know, you try to get a mix so that you've, you've got some perspective. But Peter, you, you took me in a pl to a place I didn't expect to go, and that was the whole way back to, to AOL, to Prodigy, to CompuServe. The good old days. Well, the good old days, but I guess where I'm going with it is, in today's world, is being part of a social network pretty much a necessity? No, I don't think it is a necessity. In fact, in point of fact, you know, only a certain percentage of the American population actually uses social media on a regular basis. So I think that that those of us who are in it um, have kind of a distorted sense of its importance. But the problem is that the purveyors of information that are important to a main that are important to a mainstream audience, and I'm talking about. Uh, media researchers, I'm talking about, uh, uh, you know, pollsters, I'm talking about stuff like that. I'm talking about politicians as well as, and their, and their spin doctors, weight the information that they get from social media very importantly. And I think that that has the net result of distorting the public uh, discourse as, as, as a result, because that 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 lens of distortion you know if if you if you hear let's just say 10 people in your social media feed 
complaining about a specific thing, you think, oh, well, that's a trend, you know, because our, our brains like to matrix information. We like to, we're not just really smart tool using monkeys. We're also really good at categorization, <laughs> you know, and, but the other interesting thing about us is that, you know, we, we like a lot of like chordates and in chordates alike, you know, the creatures up and down the entire animal uh, kingdom, we have, we are very, very hardwired for two different things. There's threat assessment and there's risk analysis. And you know this a little bit because you're in the insurance game. Right. You know, so we're really good at identifying threats. You know, my, my buddy asked me how I was doing today and I'm like, well, I haven't been eaten by a bear yet. <laughs> good. You know. That, that, hey, look! Uh, being eaten by a bear is a legitimate threat. Have you not seen that 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 uh, Leo DiCaprio movie? <laughs> but we're not really good at analyzing risk. You know, I mean, you take a look at the news, you take a look at social media, and you think people are dying left and right, or being shot in the streets because of MS-13 gangs or whatever other nonsense you might be hearing. And yeah, that's a real problem, and those things really do happen. But if you actually do a statistical analysis, if you actually assess the threat of being gunned down in the street, we're at a safer point now than we ever have been in our history. You know, so we get a very distorted sense based on what we see on social media and what we read in the newspaper or what we see on the new or see on the web or what we see on the television about what the real risks are. You know, is Sharia law a real problem that, you know, everybody in America has to worry about? No, but if you get your information from a specific you know, group of, of sites on the internet, or if you watch specific programs on specific channels, you'll get a very distorted sense of what that actually means and what the threat actually is in real life. You know, I turned on, I turned on the, 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 um, the radio this morning when I was driving around doing some errands. And the first thing that I heard was that the Dow was off hundreds of points down. And I thought, God, that's awful, man. There's, you know, blood on wall street. And then I realized that percentage wise, 500 points, or whatever, <laughs> on the Dow Jones Industrial Average is really not that big of variation. And by the way, it was up 200 points by the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> then, you, you know, what is the Dow Jones Industrial Average? Well, it's a specific average of, you know, of, of, of stocks from specific companies, but it's a very small group of companies compared to the entire stock market. So what does my reaction to this news that I'm hearing actually mean? Well, you know, if I read about the Dow dropping on social media from specific sources, or if I listen to it on the news, I'm going to think that there's something really wrong without being able to contextualize what that information actually means and how it actually might affect my life. You know, that's the danger is that we, we don't have the cognitive skills to keep up with the amount of information that we're, be, we're being given. And we're very poor collectively at contextualizing and analyzing that information on, a, on the fly in such a way that we can help process and sort of group think it in a way that's actually relevant and uplifting, not panic inducing. Peter, you don't come here often enough because you give some great perspective. And, and on that one, I, I just have to say, you know, that part of the problem there is, too, that there's this sense that we, we have to create an emergency on everything. I mean, how, <laughs> here's one you can identify with. All of a sudden now, every single winter storm gets named. You know, now we have, you know, the, it used to be just the major hurricanes. And somehow now it's every, every tropical depression gets a name. I swear. Yeah, it's the Weather Channel's fault. I'm not. I'm not calling. I don't know who did it, but you no, know. no, no. Seriously, legit. Look it up. The Weather Channel started naming winter storms because NOAA doesn't actually name winter storms, and they still don't. But the but the the Weather Channel wanted to, to make it easier to let people know about the uh, nor'easter that's barreling up the coast. Uh, or uh, up through the Mid Atlantic and and the Northeast region, or you know this Alberta Clipper that's come down and is going through Montana and uh, and other and so they are the ones who decided to start naming winter storms. It's and it's, it's this just, is a conspiracy. I'm mean, I'm not Alex Jones on Infowars, man. This is verifiable <laughs> information. Look it up. I I believe it, but but again, you know, to your point, the the idea that every everything is sensationalized to some degree. Because they Fox want you, they, yeah, well, 
yeah, well, they want your eyeballs. You know, they want the clicks. Yeah. And yeah, they do. They you, do. You know that that's where you got to be careful. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And and you know the old adage in the news business is if it bleeds, it leads. You know, the more sensational that you can make a story, the more readers will be compelled to to check it out. Um, and that's a, that was as true a hundred years ago in yellow journalism as it is today on websites. If you can make uh, you know, take a look at the, the recent story about the Apple Watch or about uh, Instagram killing its Apple Watch app. <laughs> Every person who I know with an Apple Watch was like, yeah, that app was garbage. It lasted like two seconds on my watch and I got rid of it. You know, believe me, if if people were using the Instagram app on the Apple Watch, they'd still be using it. And why did Instagram kill the Apple Watch? Because they never updated it after Watch OS 1. And that that SDK has been has been deprecated. So they're abandoning it because they stopped developing it as soon as they started because they realized it was a dumb idea. But you know, Instagram, you know, abandoning its Apple Watch app, that's that's you know, that that's that's a story that 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 looks worse than it is because it makes it sound like a major platform partner for Apple is walking away from their star device. Exactly. And I'm not sure, but I could I could be wrong, but I think the original quick take took pictures bigger than this, you know, the, the, the very original quick take. So this is not exactly the ideal place for a photo. Yeah. You know, from my perspective, look, I've got middle-aged eyeballs. I, I just can't look at this little, you know, 42 millimeter uh, device on my wrist and actually get any meaningful, con you know, information out of a visual image that way. You know, that's, that's why I rock the plus buddy. Yeah. You know, so I've got a bigger screen right there with you, right there with you. Okay. So to wrap this up and, and, and I also, again, I'm going to do a disclaimer because I'm sure somebody is going to email me and say, Hey, you're a bit of a hypocrite because you have a Facebook page and you have a Facebook group and you know, you're doing more on Facebook. Yeah, I, I am just like you said, Peter, because you know, that's where the audience is. So if you have something that you're trying to get out, you, you go where the, the people are. I mean, it's not going to do any good for me to go in back of my house and shout to the cornfield. But, you know, so you go where the audience is. But at the same time, you, you got to look at this stuff responsibly. So from your vaunted perspective, do you have any wisdom or any recommendations for people on how they handle their social media? Yeah. Uh, quit, quit your social media accounts. Download your data. Delete it. Go outside. Talk to people. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I didn't see that coming. I have to admit. No, I mean, look, I think that I think that w this is especially important now, um, and it'll be especially important in the future as new social media services and platforms emerge because they will. You know, anybody th th that thinks Facebook is 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 going to be the eight hundred pound gorilla, or that Twitter is going to be the eight hundred pound gorilla, um, that that it is now probably doesn't remember services like Orcut or you know whatever the other social media service of the, you know Peach or you know we we've seen a million of them come and go. Um, something's going to replace it eventually, and as new social media network or social media and social network services platforms appear. Understand before you create an account and understand now with the services that you use, how your data is exposed, what your options are for making sure that you have control, ultimate control over that data, um, and that you can change or, or remove that data as needed. Because you want control over what you're saying. You don't want to create a permanent record out there uh, of your communication that you've got absolutely no control over. That's just nuts. Keep as much of it to yourself as you can. And obviously, you know, and this is advice that I imparted to, to all of my kids, all of whom have very limited social media profiles, I should, I should point out. You know, all of them are post-millennials. They're 22 or, or younger. Um, but they don't really keep a high profile on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else worth a damn, you know, because they understand this. Be circumspect about what you post before you post it. You know, don't pick fights with people. Don't get personal with folks uh, about stupid stuff that doesn't matter. Walk away from your computer. Sometimes it's just not worth it. Uh, to, to post that thing and think about, you know, okay, if I post this and my boss reads it or my priest or, uh, my mom or my kids, what are they going to think? Are they going to be okay with me saying this? Is this something that, 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 that I can live with because it's a more or less permanent record? You know, my biggest shame about purging my Twitter account 
is that I had to, is that I felt like I had to anyway. You know, that the, the, all that stuff that I had said in the past felt like a liability to me. Now, look, I might go back to, to, to Twitter at some point, Chuck, but it'll probably be a more one-way communication than it was before. I don't really want to spend a lot of time on that service um, interacting and, uh, you know, re reacting to other people's tweets uh, if, in that way. I, I don't think it's a worthwhile use of my time anymore, but it's still a great way for somebody who, you know, works in tech journalism, for example, or, uh, you know, somebody who gauges public interest or public opinion on issues uh, to be able to engage with a very active, communicative audience. From that perspective, I think it's wonderful. Um, and that's why I think it's been such catnip to so many journalists and other people in the news realm over, over the years. My position, Peter, is that that the social media is – any of the social media platforms, pick one. Um, they're, they're like – they're like power tools. You know, they, they are very good if you use them in the right way. And if not, you can start cutting off body parts. And so, you know, you learn to use them, to your point, learn everything you can about them and how and how to use them, what, what their capabilities are, and just be careful with them. And, you know, maybe some advice that your parents gave you. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. Seriously, and better to be better to stay quiet and be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all that. <laughs> Great point. Great point. Yeah, to, to your point about power tools, Chuck, it's very true. You know, with social media, often you know because these power tools come off to us as so versatile. What's the old expression about when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail? You know, when when all you have it, or when all you're using is this one tool, everything looks like you know. Just one tool might fit it, and it, it it may very well not. So, yeah, be circumspect. You know, stay vigilant. Think about it, and and try to figure out um, how how you should be using it, and and what you're giving up as a result of it. Because sometimes you're going you're going to realize that in the end, it's just not worth it. And that's okay. Not everybody needs to be on social media every day of the week. You know, the, the ironic thing, George Orwell must be flipping in his grave right now because, <laughs> you know, we we turned ourselves into a self-surveillance society because we're vain, vapid idiots. <laughs> Great point. Yeah, <laughs> we did it to ourselves. We really did. Boy, did we do it to ourselves, <laughs> the capital I. <laughs> you know, Peter, looking back on just on on the conversation we've had, I hope that people, you know, I hope we made some people think. I, I don't know that we have some ans answers. We have some advice from our respective perspectives, but I, I think the thing is, think a little bit about it. You know, don't just react so much. Don't don't vent. Uh, you know, and, and then feel the need to maybe delete it because once it's out there, at least theoretically, it's out there. Um, you know, but by all means, think about it. Think about it. So you, you've mentioned a couple times here that you're a little bit out of tech journalism. What are you up to now? I'm doing some freelance stuff uh, out of the tech realm, uh, primarily. Uh, uh, freelance uh, uh, marketing uh, content and, uh, and other forms of writing. Cool. Good. Good. Well, I, do, I mean, we just finished talking about social media. And I know you're on Facebook, but um, is there a way folks can get in touch with you or see what, what else you're up to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can stare at my dead Twitter account. It's Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H. Um, Flarg is, by the way, where I am on, on most networks. So if you look for Flarg or Peter Cohen, you'll probably find my ugly mug staring back at you. I also have my own website at peter-cohen.com, uh, where I'll post links to stuff like this interview and uh, other guest appearances I make from time to time, um, as as well as uh, content that uh, that interests me or stuff that I've written that, uh, that I want to highlight. Good. And if you know me in real life, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Peter, it's a blast. Thank you so much for the time. we got to get you back on more because there's just always so much interesting wisdom that comes out of these discussions. Thank you very much, Chuck. It was a pleasure talking to you. I'm really glad that we did this, man. It's been way too long. It has been. I don't know where the time goes, but we got to fix it. we got to fix it. Yeah. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. Again, I hope we've given you a few things to think about. Um, Peter's approaching it one way. I'm approaching it another. Doesn't mean that there's a right or a wrong unless you're unhappy with it. If you're unhappy with it, then it's definitely wrong. Until the next time, thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Mac Voices Facebook group 
and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash macvoices and join these folks who help keep Mac Voices coming to you. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.